Welcome all for the seventh edition of the Geoscience Remote Sensing Society Young Professional and ISPRS, International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, Sudan Consortium Summer School. Well, this year we will start with webinar roundtables and also tutorials with hands on. So stay tuned in our program. This year, the event is organized by two universities of Santa Catarina, the Santa Catarina State University and Uno Chapeco. The event is sponsored and supported by two international societies, the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society and the International Society of Photogrammetry and remote sensing and the student branch of each society, the young professionals one and the student consortium one. We also invite you to navigate in our main page to see the welcome videos of our sponsors. So please do it, otherwise we will be fired. The event is also supported by our Santa Catarina State Foundation and by two companies, Geo Assessoria, that will promote a benchmarking data set in the end of the event, and the Instituto Gilson Volpato de Educação Científica. The event is also supported by different Brazilian institutions and started already on August 12th. So today we will start actually with our fourth webinar. And for that, I will invite Professor Tomazelli from the Sao Paulo State University to take this job of moderating this session. Professor Tomazelli, welcome actually to our event. And thank, thank you, you for accepting actually this job. So the room is now on your hands. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Geraldo. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all attendants. We have attendants from all over the world. I am Antonio Tomazelli from Sao Paulo State University, and I will be the chair of this section. Jorge Centeno from Federal University of Paraná and Sherry Hayes, president of the ISPAS Student Consortium, will be co-chairs of this section. It, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Armin Green, our invited speaker this morning. Professor Green was graduated in geodetic sciences in 1968 and obtained his doctorate degree in 1974 in photogrammetry, both from the Technical University of Munich. Since 1984, he is professor and head of the chair of photogrammetry and remote sensing at the Institute of Geodesy and Photogrammetry, Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. Since August 2009, he is retired and now he's with the Institute of Conservation Building Research Department of Architecture Zurich. He played a major role in the development of many photogrammetric methods, such as the bundle adjustment based on self calibration in the 70s. In the early 80s, he developed a very well known method for adaptive multiple image matching. Professor Green also applied his expertise to documenting historical sites, thus making photogrammetry most popular. One of the most significant uh, work was the documentation and virtual reconstruction of the Great Buddha in Afghanistan. He, saved, he also served as on a number of national and international scientific organizations. Within ISPRS, he was president of Commission 5, second vice president, chair of the financial committee and the chair of the international scientific advisory committee. He has published more than 500 articles and papers, and he is the editor and co-editor of over 21 books and conference proceedings. He has organized and co-organized 35 international conferences 
and has served as consultant to various government agencies, system manufacturers, and engineering firms. Professor Green also has received many awards, just to cite a few, the Otto von Gruber Award Medal from ISPRS, the Fairchild Award from the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, the ISPRS Elav Award, and the ISPRS Brook Gold Medal. He has a huge experience in lecturing, researching, and supervising students, and he will be sharing his expertise with us this morning. Uh, Professor Green will give two lectures, the first one on the White Elephant Club, and then the main uh, conference on how to write a thesis. Professor Green, floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you again for accepting. Okay, thank you very much for the long introduction. And thank you all of you for sharing my presentations here. My main presentation is on how to write a thesis. When I say thesis, I also mean paper, of course, that's included. Uh, but before I go into the main presentation, I explain briefly what the White Elephant Club is, because it may not be very well known. Uh, the White Elephant it has different definitions whether you are part of the Western or Eastern culture. In the West, if you read Wikipedia, which is heavenly dominated by Western culture facts, you read a white elephant is a valuable possession which its owner cannot dispose of and whose cost exceeds its usefulness. So a quite negative definition. But we, I mean the member of the ISBS White Elephant Club, think we are valuable and we are useful. And we rather prefer the Eastern definition, which uh, symbolizes a noble animal. And in Thailand, even if somebody finds a white elephant, he has to denote it to the king of Thailand. So uh, it's something positive for us, of course. The White Elephant Club is a group of senior officers of ISBIS who are still, some are still active, others have retired already, but they are all very much dedicated to serve the society. It was established in 2004 and it has a president, a secretary, an honorary president. We also had an honorary member, Fred Doyle, who passed away some years ago. And we have something like a, a corporate identity, which is a Thai silk with white elephants and blue and red backgrounds. I don't have a, a Thai here because it's too warm in Switzerland right now. It's very hot. So what are the activities of White Elephant Club? They have four major areas. First, transfer of technology by organizing seminars and workshops. So this would be one of these uh, activities. Initiating, coordinating, and supporting projects by bringing together users, sponsors, experts. So we act like science and technology brokers. Then we would like to bridge the gap between generations and fostering events to support young scientists and students. This applies also to the current scheme. And we like to initiate and support e-learning activities and so forth. So currently the club has 27 active members. And what we are offering since a number of years is a seminar which consists basically of three presentations. One is about writing a thesis. Uh, this is what I talk about today. One is about proposal writing. Here we had several authors, speakers in the past. And the third one is about presentation techniques, which is usually given by Professor Shunji Murai uh, previously University of Tokyo. Now, this is a, a nice picture of uh, members of the White Elephant Club, including partners, 
celebrating the uh, centennial ceremony of ISPS in Vienna 11 years ago. This was 2019, where we spent some time in China, in Guilin. We uh, went to the Li River, we had a very nice excursion and it was organized by our Chinese friends on behalf of some people who had birthdays, like Professor Konechny had celebrated his 90th birthday, others 80, 75. So today we talk about white elephant, uh, about not really anymore, about um, thesis writing, and uh, again, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Now, uh, if there are any questions at this point, I'm happy to answer if I can. Professor, I have one question. Yes. Uh, you have, besides this experience in, uh, what can I say, managing research, you have also huge experience, experience in technical merits, for example, you have a uh, huge experience with uh, matching, bundle adjustment. Uh, do you also deliver conferences on this technical matter, for example, for the PhD students abroad in several other countries? Uh, the question is whether I support uh, postdoc events? No, no, if you uh, can, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, deliver some conferences on technical stuff. Oh, yeah. More oh, yeah. Specific yeah. technical stuff, yeah. for example. Bundle yeah, I, I, kind of I, I still do. I mean, you have to realize that I retired uh, some, uh, what was it, uh, 2009, 12 years ago already. But after retirement, I'm still doing projects. I had and still have some major projects. In One is in Singapore on 3D city modeling, and one is mm -hmm. on uh, in Morea, South Pacific, French Polynesia. It's on very gen generic uh, environmental modeling. So, and from these projects, uh, I take uh, some uh, results and present them. Yeah, I still give presentation, but I have to say much less than I used to do when I was still fully active. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I really I really try to support the young people, you know, PhD yeah. students, postdocs. So I usually act as a co-author in papers because for them it's more important to be on, on, on the first place in a paper. I don't have to publish anymore. <laughs> I publish. <it. laughs> okay, thank you. Anyone? Okay, if you don't have any more questions, I think that you can now uh, start presenting the second conference and then we, we can uh, accept questions from the audience. Yes, can you see my PowerPoint. Yes, 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 it's okay. Yes, so it's about thesis writing. Okay. Uh, there are a number of topics uh, before you start writing. What do you have to do? Some guidelines and tips, nine steps in developing a draft manuscript, checkpoints to consider. There's really a list of checkpoints which you can work through, Gen some general advice and the best part of thesis writing. And in addition, as appendices, I have information about uh, literature, additional literature, web pages and writing tips. So if you want to learn more, understand more, then you can uh, use this, this information as well. Okay. Uh, in the Department of Physics, Trinity College Dublin, there was at the message board uh, the following 
uh, statement. What is how to do research? Research is to know, to know what and how to do, to do it and to make it known. I will focus here in my presentation on the second and on the fourth. Okay, so how to do it, what to do, and to make it known. Because to make it known what you have done, especially if you have done a good job, is as important as to do the job. Because if you cannot communicate your results well, people will not know. You can be the greatest scientist of all in the world. If you cannot communicate, it doesn't help very much. And in fact, some people do a very good job in doing research, but they are very bad in communicating it, writing papers, writing theses, for instance or giving presentations, and vice versa. There are people around, of course, maybe you know some, who are very good in presentation, but uh, in the background, there is not much good material. OK, so that's what we do. We talk about these topics. Now, before you start writing a thesis, and remember, again, I say when I say thesis, I mean also paper, OK? but I will focus now on thesis terminology. So before you start writing, define your topic. First, you have to understand the width of your topic if you picked one already, uh, because it should be broad enough to address important and interesting issues, but also narrow enough that you don't need too much time, that you can finish the job within the time allotted. And you have to consider that any topic seems to get bigger and bigger once you get into it. When you get deeper into the topic, you see there are so, so many additional issues. And this is a big danger that people will leave the main track, the red tape, so to say, and jump into additional issues and lose too much time. Understand the limitations of your situations. It's very important to know what is your, to understand what is your environment, your own capabilities, of course, your motivation. Are you sufficiently motivated? Do you have experience already in this area? Maybe you have to take additional classes to upgrade your knowledge about supervision. Who is your supervisor? the required lab work, how are you dependent on others? It's very important that you will depend on others normally if you work in a lab. So if you need some equipment or software or whatever, then uh, you should be, it should be clear to you when this is available or not available because it may be used by other people. So, Third, do some previous readings before you do the serious research. Make sure you understand at least roughly what you are getting into. And also study the state of the art of the issue. Because in, in real and good research, you don't redo what people have done before. Okay, You jump in at the state of the art. And, for, and go further, do something new. And for this purpose, you have to understand, you have to know the state of the art, uh, together with your supervisor, of course. So uh, very useful it's to create a timetable so that you can coordinate your work with your other commitments. Uh, so some people are very strict with their own timetable, some people are not. Uh, but you should know what's going on in your environment, time-wise also. Reading strategies. There are three levels of reading. And you should understand that when you get into the issue, you may not know exactly what you are looking, looking for in the beginning because research is not fully planable. If it would be, it would not be research. 
it would be development. That's why we talk about R and D, research and development. Development is better, better planable. Uh, research not. You can be in for surprises, positive and negative. So three levels of reading. First, read to explore. Then read to focus. And finally, read to understand. And also read critically. Research is not about believing. This is religion. If you want to believe, you have to soar to religion. Research is not about believing, but about asking questions. Don't believe everything what is written in black on white or oh, in different colors. Not everything which is published is true and correct. And I know that this creates a problem for somebody who has not much experience. But you always have your supervisor whom you can ask for help. So read critically. Try to get to the primary sources because a certain issue may be changed over time, wrongly changed, you know. So try to get back to the guy who did this and that for the first time, okay? Primary sources. Read always. You cannot do enough reading in this, in this area, uh, especially if you do a PhD thesis. There are so many publications out nowadays because it's so easy to write and to publish. Uh, it's very important to know what's going on worldwide, not only in your country, in your environment. And what I always say or said in the past to my PhD student, after five years of working on a narrow PhD topic, you should know more than anybody else about this topic, maybe including your advisor, because your advisor cannot focus on this one topic. He may have 20, I had at times 25 PhD students so I, I, I couldn't know all the details which they knew. Uh, again, before you start writing, uh, writing as you research. It's very useful when you work to take notes because you may work for months, months, even for years, and you tend to forget things if you don't take notes. Write things down, keep a journal, and list everything what is important. Uh, and then you have material which you can use already for the final thesis. And you may have to publish some universities required. So you may have to publish some papers before you do your PhD. So anyway, you have to write down parts of it. Take advantage of other people's writing skills and experiences. So for instance, if you have experienced co-authors in your papers, make use of them like your advisor also. Learn by doing. Very often, uh, I, I ask people to give some advice, you know, in terms of writing. And then uh, in the next paper, the same error could be found. So uh, this is a problem. Learn from your uh, advisors' writings and from your more experienced co-authors. Maybe you also wish to use a language editing service. There's nothing wrong with it. Many of us don't have English, for instance, as a, the first language. So we may not be as good as we should be. So there's nothing wrong uh, to use a, a language editing service. And again, writing helps focusing and clear, clearing issues. When you write something down, you will find much more easily what has been forgotten, what's wrong, what is uh, what you have, what do you have to add? Uh, if you keep everything in your brain only, it might not be sufficient. 
it's also important to help to to explain things to others in the process have discussions have some feedback from your colleagues uh, also presenting is very important or could be important as you do research presenting also will force you to think deeper and more about your issue it's another means for shaping your thoughts and also getting input from the outside world through discussions questions and answers so this is part of the larger issue of communication as I said before, doing research, good research is one thing, but communicating it properly is another one. So uh, presentations, if you do some, you would not start in front of an audience of 1,000 people. It makes you too nervous, probably. Start in your own environment, in your own group. And don't be afraid there. Uh, you all your colleagues are or have been in a similar situation so get uh, input from your colleagues and uh, so increase the audience as you go uh, piece by piece anyway in many places the defense of a master or a phd thesis also includes a presentation and even a public discussion be prepared for this now here i have some guidelines and tips first the layout the layout is very often dictated by institutional guidelines the sizes of page margins and so forth i don't go now through all the details but a layout is very often uh, given and you have to observe it maybe not strictly but roughly at least and it's useful to have a layout already given and the tip here is find out early enough about these regulations it saves time don't start writing in a different format use the required format from the very beginning and where can you find out in your library in the student office graduate school with your advisor and it's very useful in such a case to get a thesis a good one from a previous student in your department as an example but you should get a good one of course not a bad one then you have the structure of the paper or of the thesis how you organize chapters or sections again there may not be fixed regulations, but there are certain rules which you may observe. The title page, the abstract, and the abstract should be self-contained. I will talk about abstract later. A list of contents, chapters and sections with page numbers, list of tables, diagrams and illustrations, nomenclature list. This is not necessarily required some people do it and the acknowledgement and when you do acknowledgement don't go too far yeah? uh, only the most important contributors uh, don't go many pages uh, into acknowledgements then you have the main text the chapter introducing the research uh, reviewing the work that has been done before and so forth so these are the chapters which are usually in all this kind of work then you should have a list of references and uh, appendices also uh, appendices you put all these things in which would otherwise disturb the flow of reading like big tables well-known facts sample calculations background information lengthy formula maybe so uh, you shouldn't disturb the flow of reading through these things put them into the appendices so what are my tips here spend enough time in planning the structure again get copies of other good theses talk to your advisor and a third one 
write abstract and introduction chapter last. Uh, of course, in the beginning, you don't know what you are what you are getting as a result and where you go during your research. So that's why you should write introduction and abstract last. Finally, flow of contents. Uh, writing a thesis, this is now about language, okay? Writing a thesis is like writing a novel. There must be some internal logic. It should not fall apart. The chapter should not fall apart. Or they should not overlap too much. And uh, the language should not be confusing, you know? Because if you have confusing sentences in your work, the reader may not want to read it, they may give up very early, and the examiner will react with very low marks because he doesn't like uh, bad, uh, bad sentences, bad formulations. So there are a number of tips here what to do and what to avoid repetitions, for instance. Uh, you see every once in a while that people are repeat exactly the same sentences, for instance, in the abstract, and in the introduction, avoid it. If you want to say the same thing, say it with different words. Also avoid copying other people's sentences, develop your own style. Uh, nowadays with internet and digital data, I know it's very simple to get a good uh, paragraph from the internet from somebody else and to copy it into your own work. But I tell you, your advisor will understand this. Your advisor will uh, recognize it and will act with, with bad marks. Uh, okay, may maintain a thread between adjoining chapters, define all variables. Um, uh, errors that is made here very often is that uh, figures are too small, are not readable, make sure they are readable easily. Don't use the same variables for different things. Uh, leave out material that does not contribute directly to the discussion or development of an idea. So uh, don't show up, don't try to show up. Also in the references, use only the most important ones. It, it doesn't show good results necessarily if you show 250 references. It may, may show, on the other hand, that your own work is redundant because so much has been published already about it. Uh, okay, then there are some more topics. Again, I'm not going through it. Uh, Illustrations and diagrams are very important, I mentioned already. Use them in the right place, sparingly, and such that they are readable in terms of graphic style and explanations of variables. So the abstract, a few more details. The abstract provides the reader with a summary of the contents. It should be brief but contain sufficient detail. So for instance, it should include the motivation of your work, the objectives, the methodologies employed, main results and conclusions, but only very briefly, very uh, compact. And the abstract should be self-contained. The, the problem is many people may read uh, the abstract first, and if they don't like it, if you cannot raise awareness and interest, then they may not continue reading. So again, write the abstract last and use a punchy style to attract the reader. It's a bit difficult to explain what I mean with punchy. Uh, sharp wording, hard wording, you know, like a, a, a boxer is, is hitting his, his partner. <laughs> Uh, introduction, uh, define the problems that you wish to attack uh, and uh, give an indication how the work will progress and provide overview of the thesis contents. 
And for the introduction, the same, more or less the same holds as for the abstract. Write the introduction last. Do not repeat sentences from the abstract. Use a punchy style to attract reader. Again, the reader may only wish to read your introduction and make his decision of further reading dependent on the quality of this. Literature review. Literature is about uh, reviews about previous work. State why the problem of the thesis is important. Describe what others have done worldwide, really, because science is fully international. There is no Brazilian science. There is no Swiss science. Science is international. Set benchmark for your own project. Justify the use of specific methodologies in your work. So the tips are here, concentrate on the most important publications. Don't overdo it and use also primary literature. Uh, and make sure you have, you understand what's in those publications that you cite. What I do very, or what I did in the past, very often is in the exam, ask the student to explain me what's in, in this publication X, Y, Z. And if he doesn't know, he's in very bad shape, okay? Also, make sure that you don't miss the latest developments. Because if your last uh, review, if your last uh, reference, dates back 10 years and the question comes up, is it still an interesting topic? Why don't we have publications in the last few years on this topic? So make sure you don't miss the latest development. And as I said, check the international scenery. Because most of these things are nowadays published in English. Everybody can uh, check. Conclusions and recommendations for future work. Uh, tips are check if the project objectives have been achieved. If not, explain why. Uh, if you fail in your research, or at least partly fail, this is not necessarily bad. A negative result could be also important. Could keep people away from going the same path and doing the same mistake. Clearly distinguish your own work from other people's work. Don't mix it up. Present your conclusions and contributions concisely and factually and write in a punchy style again. So here we have nine steps to develop an efficient draft. Uh, I don't go through it, it's partly a kind of a repetition of what I said before, but uh, please, if you're interested, check. These are the nine steps you should observe, okay? Then I have a list of checkpoints to all these uh, uh, chapters, you know, like introduction, main part, and so forth. And these are very useful if you are actually in the process of writing, of putting things together. You can check and compare with, uh, with your own uh, result. The body, checkpoints for the body, checkpoints for conclusions. Uh, are they clearly related to the thesis, thesis statement in the body? Do they develop from the material or do they seem forced and artificial? Are the main points summarized briefly? Be honest with the critical assessment of your own result. Don't try to pretend things which you have not achieved. And are the perspectives clear and concise? Don't forget also to make clear and realistic suggestions for future work. Let people know where they should continue their own work. Again, conclusions should also self-sufficient like introduction and abstract. And there are more, there are more checkpoints which I skip here. 
uh, in the sake of time. Some uh, general advice. Uh, think of a thesis as a series of small related tasks. Don't uh, suffer under the fact that you write, uh, think you have to write 250 pages in one go. Uh, this will fail. You should split it up the whole work into small related tasks and put them together finally. Uh, don't put off writing the thesis until the end. This is what I've said already. Write as much as you can in between. Try to write 15 minutes every day. I know this is not possible, may not be possible, but it would be good if you could write on a regular basis. Don't forget to have written several successful documents before. And also realize that you are not alone. Don't isolate yourself during the thesis process because this may lead to a writer's block. Even professional writers endure occasionally writer's block. Most writers get it occasionally, but this is not a career ending disease, but you should know how you get through such a, a block. Don't suffer alone, that's the main advice. Get advice from somebody else, uh, because if not, uh, it, it may get worse over time. So finally, I talked about a lot of problems here, uh, which you have to observe. But finally, you will realize that when you complete such a thesis, it's a rewarding experience. It's a challenge and opportunity to pursue intriguing intellectual questions in a stimulating environment. It may not be possible anymore in your future environment. So make good use of the situation. You work in close cooperation with experienced people, your advisor, senior researcher, and hopefully, you will have a great feeling of satisfaction after completing the job. You should be aware that you may not get into this situation anymore in the future in your professional career. Okay, so uh, this was my presentation. If there are any questions, I try to give an answer if I can. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Professor Green, okay. for your very good presentation. I have one question. Uh, today is very common that uh, students are required to have several papers published before the, uh, going to the final defense. And it's in some uh, places, it is quite common to admit a thesis that is uh, like a branch of papers. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask uh, your opinion or your advice on uh, how to make this uh, uh, thesis more smooth, for example, when uh, merging several papers. Can you give us some opinion or your experience on this? Yeah, I have, I have experience with all systems. You know, when I did my own PhD, it was not allowed even to publish anything, you know? <laughs> so for five years, you were not allowed to publish anything, only at the end. Now, this was maybe uh, okay at those times. Uh, I talk about uh, time 50 years ago. Uh, but nowadays, you know, where things are published much more easily, faster, things are developed much faster, especially in the technology area. Maybe it's not good to do this. So you should have a kind of compromise. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm not convinced that having three peer-reviewed papers before is a good idea. 
I think it will distract and de evaluate your thesis, you know. If you really pre-publish uh, three peer-reviewed, there should be good papers anyway. Uh, who will read your thesis afterwards? I also have experience as an advisor uh, for the case where you simply take three papers and put them together. Again, I have a little bit of problem with this one uh, because it doesn't make at the end uh, not necessarily a good thesis. You know, um, it should, it, it falls apart you know, if you do this. But this is a task of the advisor. If you run through such a system, you should have somebody who controls and who makes sure that there are not too many gaps between the individual paper, but that the result is a smooth, a smooth document. Yeah. But what to what it leads is is really that the thesis itself is de devaluated. You know, because all the interesting stuff has been published before. Why should you write a thesis at all then? <laughs> okay. That's a question, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Centeno and Cheryl also would like to ask you questions before the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can go ahead. I just have one question, Dr. Gruen. Uh, given the situation that we are in right now, I think many students who are away from the, their university or from their colleagues are finding it very difficult to, to write. Do you have any advice on how they can um, overcome writer's block or how they can keep their motivation up during this uh, time? Oh, I mean, uh, very important is to what extent you can get advice. Now, you ask me for advice now, okay. So, the student will be in a similar situation. So, there should be the advice, and the advisor should get really... Advice, uh, me, advising means don't not only be there after five years for the exam, but be there and support the student from the very beginning. And I think that's the best configuration if the student can approach his or her advisor at very early and permanently. And not only the professor, but also senior scientists if they are in there around. And it's very important, you know. And also in, in the case where you have to produce a paper, then maybe you have some co-authors and the co-authors should also help you to, to improve your writing. The issue is really don't stay by yourself, don't stay alone. Maybe your parents cannot help you, maybe your sister or brother cannot help you, but there should be people around who help you. And what's very motivating is of course success. If you see some early success in your work, uh, if you work for five years and you see nothing <laughs> coming out, that's very frustrating. Early success is very motivating, very important. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, Centeno, please. Uh, Professor Grün, I have a, a relatively simple question. <laughs> this is, in many cases, uh, uh, I have students that is developing something based on well-known methods, no? like say, photogrammetry methods or geodesy methods, and supplying to solve a certain problem. And he is always doubting if he includes the description of the methods in as a review of literature, or it should be included in the methodology. No? And so sometimes we ask uh, professors and they send everything to the review of methodology because it's already known. And others say, is this is what you use, you should put it in the methodology. And what's yeah. your opinion about it? My opinion is I'm a friend of very short documents. <laughs> I don't like to read through 500 pages, you know. Especially if there are methodology described that have been developed before. 
So you know Einstein, you know Einstein. In most his most famous publications were all less than 15 pages. Okay. So um, no, I'm I'm a friend of leaving it out if somebody has been published already in a decent way, in an understandable way. There could be a situation that certain things are not uh, described properly so that you most people cannot understand it. Then it would be helpful to rewrite it, to re-explain it in your own work, you know. But you should do it in the appendices, not into the main body. Again, for me, uh, the number of pages is not a criterion for the quality of a thesis. <laughs> Did I answer? Thank you. Yes, it's, it's, it's very clear. Yeah. It, it, as I said, it depends on the clarity of the previous publication. If it, a methodology has been explained clearly, and you don't have to repeat it in your own paper. Okay, it's much more, important, much more important to understand where the international community stands in terms of development and to jump in, you know, where other people have left. This is more important to, to, to explain this clearly, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, uh, we have some uh, uh, question from the audience. Uh, the first question, uh, uh, we have this question, uh, we have before another one do, from Adenan Yandra. Uh, could you give us a suggestion, how much is a good reference for writing a thesis? How much? Yes, the question is uh, from uh, Adenan Yandra. Yeah. How much is a good reference for writing? Oh, a oh, I'm not sure what is a good reference, that. maybe? What? That, that depends how much references, the, maybe? How much how references? Much, yes, how many? Maybe, yeah, how many references, maybe? Yes. As, <laughs> as, as few as possible. <laughs> I, I had in my own thesis, which dates back a long time, I had four references. Four only, which was very nice yeah. for the advisor. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, you cannot say, uh, give a number as such, you know, it depends on the topic, of course. There are topics which are broader, where you cover more things in, in breadth. Uh, there are topics who are quite narrow, you know, theory oriented, maybe so. I cannot say, but what you what you should observe is don't put in references which do not contribute to your to your issue, which do not help. The number of references, as I said before, is not a criterion for a good good thesis. And forget, don't forget, if you put some in, you should also know what's in the reference, you know, the content, if your advisor asks you. Okay, there is a, a, another question from Daniel Braga. Is, what is the importance of meta-analysis in an exclusively scientific thesis? Um, of math analysis. Yes, meta-analysis. 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 Meta Meta. Uh, if you uh, if you t explain me what is meta analysis, yeah. can you explain? Maybe he's trying to consider uh, when you uh, uh, take more papers and analyze the the other ah, okay. uh, scientific research. Okay. So the question comes from Daniel Braga. Maybe he can. I think, yeah, I think it could be interesting, especially if you relate it to philosophical reflection, you know. It again yeah. depends, depends on your topic. If you have a topic that is interesting enough for such, you know, social issues or whatever, uh, philosophical issues, then it's, it's good to have this uh, uh, 
connection, let's put it this way. But again, it depends on the topic. There are topics which are not suitable for such a consideration and others are. What we see actually in, in engineering and technology area is that um, very little consideration is given to social sciences, the humanities, you know, and that's a big problem, of course, because the engineer should also understand social situations, uh, politics, humanities. From this point of view, it's advisable to bring in this connection, yeah. Okay, uh, there is a very interesting question from Alan Solomon. It's, how to care about self-plagiarism, it's an uh, it's important thing. It is possible to use the same figure, for instance, the study error location for two different papers. Uh, here I have no problem. Screen. Yeah, I, I, I think if, if it's your own product, you can use it two times. Uh, if uh, you try to copy a full paper and submit it to two different conferences, then uh, you can do it, you know, but the reviewer should realize this. This is why we have reviewers also, peer reviewers. Such a thing should be uh, noted by the reviewer and taken out. It's full paper copies, you know, but if you have only a, a few things like figures and so forth, I have no problem putting it in. Okay. Uh, what, what is, what is uh, sorry, what is more of a problem if you put in figures from other people's publications and if you don't ask, this happens also quite often, that people uh, copy from other publications, put in their own work. This is no good, of course, unless you have talked to the author, the other author, and you have the permission to do so, yeah? Okay, any more questions? May I ask something about this? Uh, Professor Grun, um, if, if someone takes uh, a, a, an image or a picture from an, a, another publication and include it in his work, it just uh, quotes the name of the of where it came from. Is it enough or does the he miss No. no. Legally, it's usually not enough. You have to get the permission of the person. The official permission of the... Yeah, of the, yeah, of the person. You cannot just say CC. Uh, duck, duck, duck. According to... So, I tell you, know. you a story. You know, we worked on the Buddhas of Bamiyan. We reconstructed the Buddhas of Bamiyan. And for this purpose, we needed in Afghanistan, we needed images. So we looked around at the internet and we found some images and the best one were from a source in Germany, in Darmstadt. This was a guy who was visiting years before, took very good pictures. So we took those pictures <laughs> naively. And the guy was a, actually uh, a lawyer and he let us do it. And after one year, he charged us $90 per day. So, <laughs> you understand? And uh, I went through all the legal hustle. There was nothing I could do. I had to pay because we were not allowed to use them without his permission. This was from the internet. So we thought, you know, a long time ago, it was 2002. But I, I, I was burned and the guy did it intentionally. You know, he waited for one year. He could have informed us after one week and could have told us, look, these are my images. You, you better be careful. No, he didn't. Do. He waited for one year and charged for every day. So uh, this, uh, you know, burned me. And uh, uh, from this point on, I was very careful using other material. 
And we, we also job. see that people used, adapted from, and they modified somehow the, the, the picture or the figure. Is, this is the same, applies uh, the same. <laughs> again, uh, again, it depends how much you modify, you know. It depends how much you modify. It's finally a legal issue. So I, 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 I rather stay away from this, you know, mm -hmm. because you never, when the issue goes to court, you never know what the result will be. <laughs> yeah. It is tricky, it is tricky. So my suggestion is be careful, don't do it at all. You avoid trouble. Just spend three, four more hours and make your own figure. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> okay, we uh, we have still time for maybe a couple of questions. There is one here, and uh, it's from Kalima Pitombira. He's asking how to how highlight the importance of the thesis when you don't find the expected result. So, what to do when you don't uh, achieve the results you were expecting? <laughs> Uh, what to do? Um, you have to explain in the thesis clearly why you didn't achieve it. Was it a failure on your side? You know, you can have the two situations, a failure on your side, or does a problem not allow to, to get the result? If if it's your 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 problem, you have a problem, really, you know. But if if uh, the problem as such cannot be solved in the way you wanted it, then it's useful for the community. It's also an interesting result, and this you should explain in the thesis why it is an interesting result. As I said before, research is not planable. If you start research, you never know the outcome. If you know the outcome, again, it's not a research, it's development, okay? So research can fail, there's nothing wrong. And if you explain this clearly, the failure why, because of the problem, then it's it's valuable. But if, if your advisor can nail you down and say you made a, a coding problem, <laughs> you made a mistake in the software, world, then you have a problem. I think we have another question from the audience. How do you approach a prospective uh, advisor or supervisor? Oh, there are many ways to approach a supervisor. Uh, the first is uh, a position is announced, you know, a PhD position is announced, you apply and you write a convincing application and the professor will take you. This is actually the normal case, I would say. The other case is that you, I, more and more I preferred to ask my, if I had a position, a project, to ask my colleagues, you know, uh, the peers, uh, do you have a good student? Do you have an excellent student? Uh, this is uh, always a very successful method. Uh, and uh, if you just go ahead as an applicant and write an application, this may also work, but you see such applications more and more in, in the internet. If I get uh, application, also I'm not allowed to have PhD students anymore. Since 2009, people still asking me, can I, can I do a PhD thesis with you? This is a bit of a problem for me because this also shows that the applicant did not study our environment, probably. Yeah? He should know that I'm retired, that I'm not active anymore, if he's really interested. But then you have these guys who send an application to 25 different universities worldwide without, you know, distinguishing. It's not good. It's not good. You should have some direct threat to to the uh, problem 
maybe I can follow the question, Dr. Gruen. So if you are um, still accepting PhD students or maybe other PhD supervisors, what do you think they are looking for in your application letter or in your um, application documents? What is the first thing that you maybe look at <laughs> if someone is applying as your student? If an application comes in, uh, I mean, uh, if uh, it's uh, my own student, you know, I had a student at bachelor level, master, I follow through, and I don't need an application anyway. Then in such a case, if it's uh, internal promotion, so to say, I don't need application because I know the guy very well. If somebody comes from outside, um, I'm not so much looking at grades, you know, people have grades. Of course, they could be meaningful, but that's not my first priority. My first priority is the motivation and the background. You know, depending on the project, I know what I expect on terms of uh, controlling methodology. And if somebody comes from an area which is too far away from the topic, it's a problem. It could be very intelligent, but it takes time to work himself into this a certain issue. So the closeness of his background to, to the problem is also important. Thank you very much. And uh, for instance, many sometimes you get applications where people say, I've done this and that and this and that and this and that. This is for me not necessarily a quality thing, you know. This could be that the guy couldn't socialize in a particular place. He has changed every half a year the working place. This is rather maybe a negative, negative thing. Okay, you have a question uh, from Vagmi Patel from uh, can you please elaborate how to support hypotheses in geospatial research? Uh, I'm not quite sure what is. Ahmedabad. What I've been I've been in Ahmedabad two times. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this is such a generic question. I don't know what to say. How yeah. can you please elaborate how to support hypotheses in geospatial research? Like in any research, if you want to support a hypothesis, you have to test it. And then according to the outcome of the test, it's verified or falsified, that I can say. You know, it's the same in any kind of research, not only in geospatial research. Hypothesis testing, a hypothesis is nothing worth if you don't test it, if you don't verify it or falsify it. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we don't have any more questions. Maybe I think that Professor Anigin would like to thank again for your kind conference and uh, uh, I think that we can close. Uh, Thank you very much before you close. How many people did we have in the audience? I don't see a yeah, number. Not, I'm not quite sure here in YouTube. Maybe it's common that you have much more uh, later in the, in, the, uh, in the YouTube, but I'm not sure. I think that maybe Veraldo can tell us. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, yeah. I wish 100. you good luck for the rest of the seminar, of the event. <laughs> Sherry, yeah, you yeah. will be there always, I suppose. Well, maybe I just wanted to promote it. Uh, in the most recent issue of the newsletter, you will be able to read more about the ISPRS White Elephant Club. 
So Dr. Gruen has actually written something about the, their um, club and you will read it in our recent newsletter. If you want more information, uh, please vis visit the official website of USPRS Student Consortium. Thank you so much, Dr. Gruen. Your advice is always very helpful, especially to the younger people. And you serve as an inspiration to many as well as the other White Elephant Club members. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And again, if somebody needs some more advice, uh, he can email, he or she can email, no problem. I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is coming to an end. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Uh, Dr. Gunn. Thank you, George Centeno, and thank you, Cheryl, for your very uh, kind uh, support okay, thank you thank you thank you and professor Grun, thank you very much it was a pleasure to see you again and uh, i mail professor Ver that you will be making conference to for brazil <laughs> <laughs> i hope so yeah but you know i need the invitation <laughs> <laughs> yeah Thank you, and uh, I try to look Thank how you. how many people were there, but it's difficult now to, in the YouTube. So we will send you the feedback later. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>